Andy Austin here in my dressing gown, making a cup of tea. Uh, I'm going to do a metaphor analysis. This one's been sent in by Marlies. Let me just read to you the description that she gave. It's like a burning, boiling, red-hot balloon that gets pushed in the person's face. It is held by two big old hands. can feel it reshaping around the face because of the balloon quality, but it's burning hot, melting the face off. At the same time, something is burning inside, in the heart area, about to explode via the mouth. Can't see left or right, but feels cornered, can't back out, feels raging anger. This is a dangerous person to be around. This is a person who, when cornered, becomes dangerous. Why? Because they might explode. And what's going to explode out of them is going to come out of their mouth. You may not be the one to be the person on the receiving end of what comes out of their mouth. It's likely to be a little bit volatile. It's likely to be hot. Come out raging. It's likely to burn your ears. They'll feel better though. Once that comes out, they're going to feel a lot better. Now it appears to me that uh, I'm not the only person who doesn't want to listen or be on the receiving end of this. Because for some reason they have someone shoving a big hot balloon in their face, burning their face off. This is difficult for them to face. It's something that's very hard to face up to. They are losing face by this situation. There you have the significant thing. Losing face is something that people do not like. Losing face is bad. It's humiliating, it's bad. When people lose face, the underlying structures of their heads get revealed. And I suspect this person has been very good at facing up to some things and putting on a certain front. Um, and now they've been given something that um, both blocks their ability to express the raging hot burning thing that's inside them, um, but also probably asphyxiates and smothers them. They can't take a step back because they're cornered. Well, they think they're cornered. Why don't they know? Why does this person not know where they stand? This person lacks understanding. They don't know what they're standing on. They don't know anything that's left for them. And they don't know what's right for them either. They do not know what it is they look forward to. And they don't know what's in the background behind them. They don't know what they've left behind, what's right behind them, what's left in front, or what's right in front of them. In fact, this person has no idea where they stand at all. They have no decent or good standing. And yet they rage. How did they even get there in the first place? You see, this is the person who might say to us, well, I don't know what's left or right because someone shoved a metaphoric balloon in my face and it's burning, right? Well, before that happened, why did you not know what was right for you? And before this even happened, how did you not know where you stood? So this is a person who's going to struggle to understand. So I'm going to play the game of not being understood by them or not understanding what they say. The hands are incomplete metaphor. What we have here is an anthropomorphic being. This is not someone lending them a hand. Well, when, when people are lent a hand they don't want, they're given a hand, um, usually it's a disembodied hand that is attached to them, um, clinging on, and while well, someone gave me a hand, and <laughs> it's not what I want, to be honest. That doesn't seem to be what's going on here. Th what we have is an incomplete metaphor because, well, they can't even be bothered to tell us what's in the background because that would require a bit of thought. They can't even be bothered to tell us what's right for them in this situation because, again, that would require a bit of thought. They're very unlikely to be readily going to tell us what the hand's mechanism is, so basically what are the hands attached to, um, if anything at all. We do know the two qualities, the two of them and their old hands. The old is probably very significant. There's another significance in this metaphor too. The balloon, as well as being hot, um, I believe it was red. It's a red hot red balloon. Now, I don't yet know um, when colour is mentioned in metaphor. Because metaphors are, um, what's the word, proprioceptive, and I'm grateful to Charles Faulkner for that distinction, we don't see a metaphor, we don't really feel a metaphor, it just is, and it's experiential, so we're on the inside of it. As a result, the colours usually are very rarely referenced, as is sound. Children may reference sound, but it's not very common. It does happen, but it is not common. 
When people reference colours, um, they don't do it very often. And when a thing is given a colour, that lends a certain significance. I don't yet know why some colours are referenced in metaphors and others aren't. I wondered at first if it was primary colours. No, that doesn't, that's not the case. Um, I wondered if it was sort of culturally bound stuff like red is hot and blue is miserable, that kind of stuff. That doesn't seem to be it either. Although this one, of course, red and hot are an association. The colour brings a certain level of attention to the object that is referenced. Colour isn't referenced to anything else, only the balloon. So for this individual, the balloon is the most important component. Now to me, the balloon is actually the least important component. We know they're losing face. We know they, they're, they're, they're having trouble facing this thing. Um, and also that the, the consequence of the balloon means that they, are, they can't breathe. There's asphyxia going on here. Um, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing for them to be facing. That's the red herring, pardon the pun, for the same colour, because the red herring is they want you to focus on the balloon, because that's, for them, the most important thing. Because if that balloon wasn't there, held by these pair of elderly hands, we don't know if they're male or female, hazard a guess, stick it in the comment section, do you reckon these are male hands or female hands? There are clues in the metaphor, but we'll get... No, we won't get to that. Put it in the comment section. This is one for you to puzzle through. There's a very good reason how I know what gender those hands are. Uh, Marley's, if you're watching this, don't help them out here. So, um, the balloon is the one where the focus is. The person will basically have the experience, if that balloon wasn't being shoved in my face, this thing here that's burning on the inside of my chest could be released and I'd feel a lot better. But I'm unable to express the hot rage that's inside me, and because of that, it's burning up on the inside and it's going to explode. There's a cause and effect relationship this person has built in. It sounds very compelling to that individual, but it's absolute nonsense, of course, and it won't help them. Sure, to create a different context where their back's into the corner and there's no balloon there, they can express themselves, and that rage comes pouring out their mouth. Sure, and you potentially would be on the receiving end of that. It'll burn your ears, whatever they're saying. Why doesn't that person know where they stand? Why are they not able to take a step back? Why are they even backed into the corner in the first place? Why do they not know what's right, what's left for them, and where they stand? That is the important detail. Now, they might say, well, if this person over here simply changed their behaviour, then I, wouldn't, I would be able to see those things. Right. But that's not true either, is it? Because even then, prior to this situation happening, they didn't know where they stood. They didn't know what was left, right, front, back, what they stood on. They don't even know what they stand for. This is a person who stands for, well, who knows? They don't even know. That's the issue here. What is important to them? Where do they stand in this world? What is their place in the world? So that's the key area that I'm going to be thinking of, but I'm not necessarily going to point that out directly. I will ask it by I'll ask questions and intimate those things so it can dawn at the right speed and rate for that individual. Give too much insight too quickly, it can really mess people up. They go, oh, I can't cope with this, it's too much. You're not listening to me, and so forth. So what else have we got going on here? The in, this thing that's burning, burning up on the inside, again, incomplete metaphor. Well, all we know is at the same time, something, 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 something is burning inside in the heart area, about to explode via the mouth. So it's not something, it's an explosive something. And it's an explosive something that has a root and a direction and a channel. They know it's going to explode out the mouth. It's not going to explode out the chest. It's not going to explode out the back end of them. It's not going to explode out their neck. No, no. It has a channel to it. It has form. It has some structuring to it. Not just a random thing. At the same time, it's just something. Yeah, right. Nicely done, nicely presented. That person knows exactly what that is. They've experienced it before. They know exactly what it is and what happens to it. What they're not doing, though, is telling you. Why aren't they telling you? Because they can't face it. They simply can't face it because they'd rather face this instead. That's what's happening. So, if we're going to get them to take steps, we could get them to take a step back. Um, oh, I can't, there's something behind me. Okay, well, what is it? Let's get more information. Take a step back and tell me what you notice. What happens? How does that change things? Take a step to the left. Tell me what you noticed. What happens? How does that change things? And so forth in the different directions. We need to get more data 
about this because this person could be in a container for example could be um, they could be on a ledge so taking a step back sends them over the edge um, we actually don't know we, we we don't know anything this is the client that has presented the situation where they say I don't know and they're able to say I don't know to pretty much anything you ask them it's a brilliant way of getting through life I don't have to be responsible for where I stand in this world. I don't have to stand for anything. I get to complain, well, <laughs> struggling here, um, but I get to feel bad and all the rest of it, but not be the one to actually take responsibility proactively. I can take responsibility reactively, which is quite a common thing, I've got to say, among client groups generally. Uh, the greater the level of problem a person has in their life, the greater the level of reactive processing we will see rather than proactive designing the problems out. This is a problem, this is a person who's got into the situation prior to actually working out where they are. Um, so a little bit of proactivity would go a long way for this individual. So we also have um, other things to look at here is the identity components. Um, and these are very easily missed. It's a Hertz metaphor. Hopefully you've got that. Now being a Hertz metaphor, because the face is being burnt off by the balloon, there's the asphyxia element not yet referenced by the client, and there's the burning up inside. So it's Hertz metaphor is superficial, but it's also about identity. Hertz are about relationships. And uh, so these are, hurts are the qualities by which we allow other people to relate to us. I'll say that again. They're the qualities by which we allow other people to relate to us. Now, as a result of that, what we know is that these qualities by which they're relating are very much about identity, because this is a person who can change their face. Uh, their face changes according to the heat that's applied. Uh, the heat is applied externally and internally too. Everything about them will change when there's anger. So this is a person who other people will have learned to potentially stay away from, albeit contextually so, or permanently so. There's somebody I know who is very quick-tempered, um, lives quite close to... Anyway, I, I tend to avoid that individual simply because I never know when they're going to blow. And I've been around in the past when they've blown. It's like, I think I'll be somewhere else now. Thank you very much. Simply because I don't want to be around to be the recipient of this anger. And here we have what is the relationship this person here has with whatever this anthropomorphic entity is. It's got hands, it's likely to be a person. Gender, as yet, unspecified. Comment section. This is a person who also is unwilling to face this person. Uh, and in fact, we could even argue they are defacing this person. And this person is being defaced. What is it that's being defaced? Identity and expression. So, now we can start to look at what is expressed, and this is where it starts to get a little bit complicated. Those that have done IEMT training will be familiar with the work around the pronouns, and you should know that self is expressed by I, whilst me is a, recipro a recipient of you. Me is a container. So you fill me with hope. I express myself. So now self is what is not being expressed. And the face is what is not being, um, what's well, being changed or defaced. So now this is very much about self-expression, being inhibited, but it's an angry self that's gonna be expressed. It is also about me being defaced by you. So there's a very complex set of relationships going on here that are not very positive for anybody. One of the things I'm gonna be doing whilst I'm working with this particular individual and getting more information, I'm gonna be paying attention to their hands. What are these arms doing? I mean, for goodness sake, why is a person standing back into a corner being suffocated by a raging hot balloon? I mean, what is going on here? Um, and most of all, what are they doing with their hands? I won't ask that question directly into the metaphor because they will not have thought of that and they will just make some shit up to try and satisfy the question. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna watch what are these hands doing? Here's my favorite. This is much more a male thing than a female thing. And it's, uh, what's it called? The velvet fist or the velvet glove. They make a fist with one hand and it's all tense. And then this one's all lovely and soft. And they've got a big fist and they, they, they hold it somewhere on the lap or to the chest and they're massaging it like this. It's a very, very strange gesture that you see. Knuckles are going white and they're just rubbing it. So one part of them is ready to rage and the other one is soothing. 
be aware if you have a client doing that gesture. Um, it leads to some interesting experiences when you're working with them. So whilst exploring more of the metaphor, I'm going to be watching their body language very much. What are they doing? How are they sitting? Are they leaning back? Are they leaning forward? Are they slouched off to one side? What's going on here? Because whilst they're in the metaphor, you're going to see some corresponding physiology going on. The corresponding physiology might be micro movements. It may not be particularly overt. And the micro movements are incredibly hard to see, so I don't worry so much about that. But it's the overt gestures and overall posture that I'm going to be looking at. Now, how would I help this person? What would I do with them? I have absolutely no idea yet. But there's not enough information within the metaphor to know what it is I'm going to do. So, First of all, I'm going to ask them to take a step in each direction, what happens, what do you notice, that kind of stuff. Um, get more data first. Um, going to certainly build up what is the mechanism of the hands, so basically what are the hands attached to, and extend out the metaphor. This is the person who is only aware of their immediate experience. As soon as you introduce range into the metaphor, so you go beyond the immediate, their quality of data will start to break down. This is unlikely to be a proactive thinker. This is going to be a reactive thinker. It has to whack them in the face before they think to do something about it. Um, most people would try and avoid these situations in the first place. I would suggest this one did nothing to avoid this situation. Not saying they deserve it, not saying that they're not a victim of whatever this bizarre relationship is going on. I mean, this is something that I certainly wouldn't want to be part of but they could do a lot more to try and protect themselves from these kind of setup, these kind of experiences in the future. Comment section below if you have any other things to add, anything I've missed, any idioms that I've missed that you can throw in there too. Um, if you want to have a guess and why, put a reason why, not just you've got a 50-50, although in these enlightened times, who knows, maybe it's not, because everyone's non-binary these days. So maybe they've got these weird, weird, basically what gender are the hands? and give your workings. Why do you reason that one? And uh, I'm going to be interested to see what you come up with.